On today's show, we break down the UFC 245 main event as Kamaru Usman and Colby Covington put words aside and finally engage in octagon warfare. Having terrorized the welterweight division since 2015, Kamaru Usman's 10-fight winning streak culminated this March with a stunning demolition of Tyron Woodley. That's it. We got a new champ, folks. And now in his first title defense, he faces a rowdy rival who has walked the walk and talked the talk. Colby Covington's own impressive rise in the division has seen him prove beyond doubt his championship caliber. A masterful effort out of Colby Covington. And now he gets his shots at the undisputed title. Will Covington's dream become a Nigerian nightmare or will chaos reign at UFC 245? Hello and welcome to UFC Inside the Octagon. John Gooden alongside Dan Hardy as usual. And today we will be looking at the huge welterweight title fight between Kamara Usman and Colby Covington, which headlines a blockbuster UFC 245 pay-per-view. Dan, they have followed similar career paths through that welterweight division. There have been megaphones involved, scuffles in <laughs> hotels. But finally, they condense it down to the octagon. What a fight it's going to be. But there's an awful lot of psychological stuff at play in this one. Yes, and, th and that's 50% that's of the conversation, really, is the psychological game and how that's going to impact the fight going forward. And for me, Colby Covington's running the show when it comes to the out of octagon antics. You know, he's, he's got inside Kamaru's head. We saw that at the press conference with Kamaru taking his shirt off and coming out all, you know, flexing and angry looking. If that crosses over into the fight, though, that's exactly what Colby Covington wants. And so that's, that's where we've got to figure out how Kamaru Usman deals with that tension and whether Colby Covington's done the right thing by prod and the bear or actually just made his life a lot more, a lot more difficult. Yeah, yeah. And what I really like about this as well is they're both in peak form and their last performances were excellent. Yes. You know, all the other stuff aside, they have both looked phenomenal coming into this one. Right, as we always do, let's pill up the facts and the stats. The champion... The challenger, Colby, would argue that he should be wearing the <laughs> old-style belt over his belt. We have to stick to the actual laws here. Uh, is there anything that we can read into that? Just a four-inch? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, it is a reach advantage that will make a difference. There are some clips later on in the show which you will see the, the, the difference that that extra couple of inches on Kamaru Usman's arms will make. Certain times he'll land punches which... You know, someone with a 72-inch reach may have just missed. So he does make the most of that reach, and I think that in this fight, I mean, as always with MMA, range is a big topic of conversation. I feel like Colby needs to take that range away as quickly as possible, and Kamaro it needs to needs to create that range. And utilizing his range is gonna, you know, he's gonna be a, a big weapon in that. I'm gonna highlight this. 100% takedown defense. Yeah. Now, one thing that we haven't mentioned straight out the gates is both of these fighters have developed from a wrestling base, obviously have mixed martial arts skill sets, but 100% takedown defense, that's going to get challenged. It, it is, absolutely. But not bring it down too much because I expect Usman to defend a good portion of takedowns. Yeah. But it, it's, it's the hustle from Colby which finally gets people to the floor. And the stat that you've got there as well, that's, talking to the hustle, okay, you were talking the wrestling hustle, hustle but also... That That's was a, a phenomenal yeah. performance to, to post that amount of strikes against uh -huh. Lawler. Yeah, and someone, someone who's, you know, physically very strong and powerful, has fought at weight classes above welterweight, has got excellent takedown offense as well, and denied Colby Covington the first few attempts that he went, and he continually chased after that takedown to get it finished. And that's, I mean, there are so many similarities between these two guys but there are also so many points of difference between the two, which, and it's not until you actually look into their games. I mean, you know, the obvious ones, Southpaw v. Orthodox, that kind of thing. But the way that they approach the game, even though they're both wrestlers, they have a, they have a very different style. You were saying 50% of the analysis could be down to the psychological aspect. So let's touch on the mind games again. Uh, who do you think is going to be greater affected by the game playing with the mental side? Well, this is this is the, the question going into this fight because I think that there are a lot, particularly in the first two rounds, if I assume this is going to be a five-round fight, I think that two... Oh, I assume it's going to go the distance, shall we say. Those first two rounds, a lot of questions will be answered in those first two rounds. And a lot of questions around how Kamaru deals with the pressure that Covington's going to put him under in the fight, but also the pressure that he's created outside of the octagon as well. And does that... 
does that make Kamaro more effective at what he's going to do or does that make him fatigue faster? Because I would expect a weapon of Covington's is going to be his conditioning. It will be putting a pace on Usman that will slow him down. So the psychological games that Covington's played going into this, in my opinion, just expedite whatever will actually happen in the fight. Right. If Covington's going to drown him in pressure and wear him out, that's going to happen faster if Kamaru Usman's you know, aggressive and angry and frustrated. If Kamaru Usman's game plan comes together, that's a more angry, more dangerous Kamaru Usman that you've just spent a good bunch of months winding up. Mm. So it can go one of two ways. Yeah. And like I said, there are so many questions in those first two rounds that for me will dictate how this fight pans out as it continues on. Yeah, that is fascinating, mm. isn't it? That side of things. Okay, well, let's get into the, the analysis then. And you've taken a bit of a different approach to this one in the way that you've structured the playlists. Straight off the bat, top line, wrestlers, with striking, but it is so nuanced. There are yes. so many different levels to this one. We're going to kick off with, with Covington and the way that he is going to approach this fight early on, because that then leads on to the response from Usman. So uh, over to you, Dan, and yeah. how this sets up. Well, the reason I put them in that order is because if I look at both the fighters, which one of the two is likely to take the initiative in the first round? First bell rings. I expect Covington to be on Kamaru Usman's toes he straight away. He normally runs to the middle yeah. of the octagon. He'll, he'll be right over there. He'll be, he'll be mauling with punches. He'll be clinching him and trying to take him down. So that's why we've picked this playlist first. This is really what I expect from Colby Covington. As soon as that first bell rings, this is what Kamaru Usman's got to deal with. And it's that, it's that, that heavy wrestling offensive backed up by 40, 50, 60% power punches that are constant. It is a constant work rate. There are a couple of things that he does consistently. One is the dip head kick. He likes, there it is again, look. He puts a little dip in the head kick because it confuses his opponent. They're not sure exactly whether he's level changing because he drops his head as well. Watch this, watch how, watch how he steps into this. It's just a, this is against Wagner Silva. Little dip of the head, thinks they're going for the takedown, then comes with the high kick. So that's the first thing. This is a nice little clip because it shows the sequence that he does. What we're gonna see after this, he's gonna do a dip again to see what Wagner does. There's the dip, and then he goes a power double. It's just that split second of hesitation. Is he gonna come with the kick or the level change? And he's, because it's worked consistently for him throughout his career, it's become kind of a staple of his game. You know, everything bolts on to a takedown, a takedown attempt, driving people into the fence. Most of his takedowns, most of his best work he's done against the fence. And I, as I said before, it's that hustle. It's, it's stripping someone's base away, expecting them to build back up and then taking them the opposite way. Using good head position and smashing them with short shots as well, just to kind of keep people's brains cloudy, to keep the, the chaos, that's what the chaos yeah. is. It's not chaotic in his style necessarily it's chaotic in what is going on in his opponent's head so many different stimuli to deal with and consistently he does this as well grabs that wrist and then folds his opponent over it and then from this point he's got their body weight on that wrist and he can basically just pepper them with shots and he's not going to hit you with anything massively concussive I ju we've just never seen it in his career he's not that kind of puncher if he puts you in a bad position and hits you he'll hit you with 10 or 15 those shots instead of the bang Bang, the big power shots. The difference with Kamaru Usman a little bit. Kamaru puts more power into his game. But it's these short jabbing shots, these, these wearing people down against the fence where the referee's looking, thinking, this guy just doesn't want to be in the fight anymore. Mm. Most of his TKO stoppages are because people are just like, they just can't get out of that, that cloud of chaos that he puts on them. So I expect him to do that. And I expect him to probably need the full five rounds to get that win over Kamaru Usman. Mm. I think if he does get a finish, it's going to be later in the rounds when some things have already been effective in his game to create that vulnerability. I don't think there's any other way for him to approach it. He's not going to counter strike with Usman. I think he'll feel like he's the better wrestler. Credentials on paper, D1 versus D2, he should be the better wrestler. But the comparison with the two, you've got an endurance wrestler, a marathon wrestler against a power wrestler. And it can go one or two ways. That's what the two rounds is about, the first two. So, Dan, what if that is how... Covington approaches the first opening stanza. What's the response from Usman? How does he look? Okay, so, so two ways to go about it. One, he can, he can meet that wrestling pressure with wrestling. But if he loses that exchange, he's also lost a lot of conditioning in the process and he might end up in a bad position. What we did see him do in the Woodley fight was turn him and put him up against the fence. And I think that's a, a highly likely possibility. But his first thing to do, he wants to knock Covington out. He wants to hurt him because yes. of the drama going into this. So it's all about takedown defense 
and striking. And his striking is far more disciplined than Covington, far more ranged, far more selective in the shots that he throws. And this is what I was talking about with that reach, you know, making the most of the full length of his arms. There are times when the clinch will break and he'll fully extend his arm out and just clip somebody on the end of his range. Like, look at the distance on this strike. You can see the full extension of the arm from Usman as he's throwing it. So they're in the clinch. and. I think this is where some of the fight is going to be won for both of these guys, striking in and out of the clinch. Who takes the initiative to do that first and who's the most effective with it? So immediately breaking the clinch, I would say Covington's going to be throwing good elbows in that, in that range. As soon as they back out, it's the wild long shots from Usman that he's got to watch out for. So watch this. Watch the full length of this. Bang! That is a full extension. Unfortunately, the referee's slightly in the way. But you can see when that punch lands, that's a full extension of his shoulder. Everything's yeah. out, you know? And that's, there's even a bend in the arm before it lands. You can see Strickland's got his chin right in line with that punch. There's no mug in the He's striking not. ranges as well. No. And someone that is, see, look at that. That's full length of the arm. Yeah. Like, if, 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 his, if his arms are six it's, inches short... 76-inch reach. Yeah, four-inch reach advantage. So, I mean, yeah. that's, you know, they're the punches that are potentially going to land for him that won't for Covington. So managing that distance and, you know, the strength and the, and the power of Usman does come into play with the takedowns because he's got to defend some takedowns early. Covington is going to try and wrestle him because that's the best way of getting Usman weakened, grounded, you know, fire blanket him, make it safe for Covington early in the rounds. And I think the, the most likely thing to do is to, to wrestle him. We just don't see this kind of punching power from Covington. We've ne we never have. I don't know whether he's got it or not. I don't know whether he, he manages that power in his punches intentionally because he's looking at the marathon. He's looking at, you know, he, he's, he's working into those championship rounds in the first round before he's even started. Whereas I feel like Usman, with the tension, with the anger coming into this one, if he gets the opportunity to swing at Covington, he's going to put everything into that. Yeah. It just depends whether Covington's in the way of receiving those shots or whether he gets out of the way and, yeah. you know, his opponent's fatigued because of it. Yeah. What I like, well, one of the things I like about this fight is the fact that these guys have a similar record. They've been around a similar amount of time. And as a result of that, there's been common opponents. I think they've had three. Yep. But Dan, you have, I'm going to pull it up, you have identified some very interesting stats which underpin a lot of what you're saying here mm -hmm. from the commonality of their performances against Damian Meyer. Yeah. Well, th this is the most interesting because this, the difference is that it was five rounds to three rounds. So five rounds for Usman, managed to get 66 significant strikes off over uh, 209, okay? Covington, over three rounds, 10 minutes less, 88 significant strikes out of 317 attempted. So there's over 100 more significant strikes attempted with two rounds less. So you can see the work rate of Covington. And I think that's part of the reason why he didn't have to defend nearly as many takedowns as Usman did against Damian Meyer, because he took the initiative and he pressured Damian Meyer, whereas yeah. Usman... Covington takes Covington into the octagon and he forces Covington on you. Usman comes into the octagon and sees what his opponent's going to do and adapts himself around them, which is what he did against Damian Meyer. He was adaptable to Damian Meyer's game. Covington went in and just put chaos on him. So that's where I feel like Covington takes the initiative, keeps the work rate higher than, than Usman, and Usman's the one that's got to be adaptable and deal with what Covington brings to the table. If only they had stats for the training room brawls between him and Lawler, then we <laughs> oh, could have man, can you imagine? We could have gotten something there. <laughs> OK, we're going to go to a break right now, but you don't want to miss what we've got coming up because Dan's going to talk about the methods to victory for both of these fighters. See you on the other side. Welcome back to UFC Inside the Octagon, where we're talking about the main event for UFC 245. Dan, Covington versus Usman for the gold. Give us a quick recap from part one. OK, based on what I know of these two guys, Covington's the one that's most likely to take the initiative and put pressure on Usman early. So heavy hands, brawling style, trying to wrestle him to the floor. And then really it depends on what Usman does with that and how the psychological game has impacted his conditioning. Does he get too angry and swing hard? You know, does he try and defend his wrestling, hold him against the fence? Lots of questions I feel will be answered after the first couple of rounds. Once we've seen these guys interact and that's when we kind of go on to the, the strong suits of each, of each fighter. OK, well, let's get into that then. So I guess the, the headline to this is both of these fighters are very, very well versed in wrestling, but they have striking as well and they mix their arts particularly well too. But they obviously have different ways in which they 
they mix their arts, and you're yeah. going to give us a look at that now. Yeah, they do, they do very much so. A lot of the time when you see Kamaru Usman, they're, they're big, high-amplitude takedowns where he's lifting and he's slamming. And we do get some of those takedowns from Covington as well, but most of the time, he's got that kind of grind, drag you down to the canvas, keep taking your base away, and exhaust you in the process. Like, th these are the kind of takedowns I expect from Usman. Just drive big power because he's got that in the tank. If he needs it, he's got that power in his legs. He's got that power in his upper body. He can lift people and slam them. And then that little disorientation that we spoke about when uh, DC does it to people, yes. he's got that for a moment while he can start working. Being able to take Woodley down like this as well, being able to work him in the clinch, this is what kind of sways me to think, you know, Usman might be all right with Colby in the clinch. But I don't know whether that's partly because Woodley didn't really show up in that fight or not. Mm. You know what I mean? I think Colby's going to... didn't allow him to. No, he didn't. But at the same time, that, that Colby wouldn't do this. Colby wouldn't allow himself to be pushed up against the fence. Right. If he's up against the fence, it's because he's stuck there and he can't get himself off the fence. And then we start getting the big takedowns from Usman. But to be honest, it, it's going to be more Covington closing distance. I see much more of this kind of stuff. Scrapping against the fence, chasing ankles, chasing legs. You know, can Kamaru Usman use his power to get himself off the fence and get him out to space, or can he use that power to overwhelm Covington? If it doesn't, the problem is that Covington can do this for 25 minutes or more. We know he can. What he did to Robbie Lawler put him right at the top of this, this style of fighting in my book, because I know how difficult Lawler is to take down, how difficult he is to hold down, how difficult it is to break him psychologically. And at no point in that fight did you see Covington feel like that fight was slipping away from him. Like, he dominated that fight. And I feel like if he gets into this one against Kamaru Usman and gets through those first round and a half, two rounds, starts to feel that sapping of energy from Usman, his confidence just goes on the rise because he gets better, whereas I feel like Usman's got the possibility of hitting that nitrous tank a few too many times and then find himself full of lactic acid and not being able to respond. I am crossing everything that we see a follow-up performance from what they last entered into the octagon with. Just yeah. outstanding. Flow state, 10 out of 10 from both of them. Yeah. Um, sorry, back to the analysis, Dan. <laughs> when it hits the ground then, so ground fighting, yes. what are we looking at for both of these fighters? Okay. Well, this is where it gets different. So th they've both got quite a, quite a distinct direction which they go when they're deciding they're putting their opponents on the floor, which for Covington, as we've said, mo is most of the time. He'll come out, he'll punch his way into a clinch, and then he'll work his body locks and his takedowns towards the left. Oftentimes, because he's level changing, and he's trying to take the legs away, he exposes the back as people are trying to get back up. Whereas Usman, on the other hand, he goes body locks and he uses a nice like hip check takedown against the fence or like an outside trip. The benefit is because he's body to body, he tends to end up in a top position. So it, it changes the options for both of them on the floor. It's almost like Greco versus freestyle. It is in a, a little crude bit. Crude sense. Well, this is what I'm talking about. See, I mean, that's a knee tap there. He's dragged him along the fence, but the control is still upper body. You know, here he is again, look, this beautiful work against Yakovlev. Drags him back, wrist control on this near side here. And then if he gets to this top position, the most consistent thing we've seen him do, aside from ground and pound, is, is chase the, the arm triangle. But even in this position, you can see how strength-based it is. Like, he's gone to ground, he's gone to punches there because he knows he's not going to get that. But in circumstances like when he won the Ultimate Fighter, where he does get it, you can see there, look. Watch that takedown here. Let me just watch it from this angle so you can see it again. So, it, so it, watch how he revolves around the body. He's got that body lock. It's like he's, he's, like he's orbiting uh, Haider Hassan as he's working for this takedown. Because Hassan lets go of that arm, he comes around to his back, and then spins again, but always body lock, chest to chest. And when he takes him down as they land, Haider's on his back. This, I, I feel, is interesting because the most comfortable position for a wrestler to go to when they hit the floor is all fours. So if I'm Kamaru Usman getting taken down by Covington and I get taken down, my instinct is to turn and base, which plays into Covington's game because he wants the back. The difference here is that if Usman's able to get Covington on his back, he's done it against Covington's will because there's nothing in Covington's mind, instinctively or otherwise, that says lay down on your back. Because as a wrestler, you belly out, you base down. So the likelihood of his game playing out is going to be much more, again, strength-based because he's got to force Covington there. Whereas if Covington's chasing Usman's back, the likelihood is Usman will give the back as he's getting back up. Again, like minute details of mm. how these are very different, but how it could affect the fight. And again, and I, I, you know, we talked about it with the Woodley one, and I know this fight was a little while ago, but that's a strength-based arm triangle. The technique's not correct, the leg's not in the right place. Haider Hassan just had no gas left. He was just getting the life squeezed out of him and couldn't fill his oxygen back up. That's why he got the tap. 
Same thing with Woodley. Like there was no subtlety in the setup of that arm triangle. It's like, uh, got your arm, got your arm, got your arm, and then Woodley's trying to fight it back with strength. So then you've got this power against power thing. So anything that Usman's doing to a tighter two work Covington, Covington's going to be able to feel that it's coming. I would, I would, I would. The counter is that Usman's going to be the stronger fighter in there. So if he forces something on, then the likelihood is he, he's going to be able to get it to work. But strength will be an ingredient of that process, and that is finite. So on the other side, and you alluded to it, the way that Covington goes about his work and. He's looking to take the back, which opens up his own his own fight finishing capabilities. Obviously, with with the rear naked choke, etc. You've found some examples. For yeah, that. like like I said, very different, a bit looser in his style, which is why he has to scramble and continually, you know, work one takedown after another. But it's it's that hustle which is part of the weaponry of his arsenal. That's the part of the reason why he is exhausting on people because there's always something he's working. He's touching them, he's tapping them, he's dragging them from one place to the next, constantly making them work, but gives them enough space so they can move a little bit. Like, enough space here for his opponent to turn solidly to his knees, enough space for him to get a hook in, enough space for him to threaten the neck. Like, he's not clamped down like Usman is. He's not muscling people into position. He's moving around them, and he's recognising what he needs to remove to keep them on the floor. So I feel like the vulnerabilities that he can expose in Usman's game based on pressure, based on space for him to work, and this rear naked choke's gonna be there all day if Usman gets taken down. And there's only so many times you can get taken down and back up and think about defending your neck while you're fatigued. Eventually, that, that vulnerability becomes, becomes evident. And if, if someone's gonna get it, over 25 minutes, Colby will find that neck. I'm just trying to imagine what's worse. And I, I think I said earlier, like, what's the worst way to like, go out, whether it's that attrition or if it's like, put your lights out. But also, I'm just trying to think of my novice time on the mat when I've got a really heavy guy who's pinning me there or like a constant scramble. Mm. And then it's demoralizing. And I'm not sure what's worse. Yeah. They're both horrible. They are, they are. But if they were both power-based and Usman's dealing with someone like Covington taking him down and holding him down, while he's being held down, he's resting. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas Covington doesn't stop moving. So there yeah, isn't an opportunity. Yes. There might not be the strength that... But you can't <sighs> breathe sometimes with that shoulder pressure. If you're in an arm triangle, then your blood pressure is going to go up a little bit because yeah. oh, I've got to de defend a submission here. Yep. But, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm trying to work. And they're sure. both and, yeah. bad situations. And, and, that's, and, and we'll circle straight back to the start of the show. This is where the psychological uh, game comes into play. Because if you're Kamaru Usman, you're two, three rounds down, your body's starting to hurt, and you're stuck in the, on the bottom position against Covington, who's been talking a whole load of trash going into that fight, that's not like being pinned by your mate who just happens to be a better wrestler. That's being held down by someone you don't like, yeah. who is doing that to you on national TV, the biggest show of the year. On Probably pay -per -view. smiling at you, talking maybe talking trash. to some people yep. high in the political office. <laughs> and, and it won't stop when the fight's over. Yeah. If Usman loses that fight, he's still going to have to hear from Colby Covington every oh, yeah. time he sees him. We're all going to hear from Of course, but that's a part of the battle. That's one of the reasons why it's so imperative for Usman to win. Not to maintain his belt, but just because he, he just doesn't want to have to deal with Colby anymore. Yeah. You know? Oh, what a fight. Very much looking forward to that one. Keep the conversation going using the hashtag inside the octagon. Tweet at UFC Europe. And we would both like to take this opportunity to thank every single one of you that has watched throughout 2019. It's been an absolute pleasure doing this show. Happy holidays. We will be back in 2020. So lots to look forward to there. Plus, we have an inside the octagon extra for this one. Until then, thanks very much. <laughs>